Good morning. Go and take your seats. We're going to get started here on time, I hope. Okay, welcome everybody. We're going to try to stay on schedule here this morning, so we'll go ahead and get started as uh, folks keep filtering in. So on behalf of the Travis County Medical Society Physician Wellness Program, I want to welcome you all to our first wellness symposium. I want to thank our co-host, Dr. Carrie Barron, who helped us uh, secure the spot here and um, help us get ready for today, uh, Dell Medical School, uh, our TCMS staff, um, I want to really thank them. They're in the back. Raise your hands and uh, everybody give them. Good. They've worked really hard, full-time uh, medical society staff and uh, part-time caterers or uh, something. Anyway, they've worked really hard to get this together tonight. Today, we're, we're trying to do this on a budget, and so uh, we did the catering ourselves, and, and actually they did the catering themselves, so we really appreciate that. Um, all of our speakers, I really appreciate you being here today. Uh, CME notification. This symposium has been accredited for three Category 1 credits and three credits in the area of ethics and or professional responsibility. To receive credit, you will fill out a CME form that is in your packet. Um, turn it in at the end of the program. When completing the form, put your participation hours in the Category 1 credit column and in the ethics credit column. Turn in the white copy and keep the yellow copy. This is kind of like where they show you how to use a seat belt on an airplane, I think. Um, please take a moment to complete and turn in the evaluation form as well. So anyway, please just turn in the forms on your way out and I'll try to remind you at the end also. In an effort to keep our Saturday morning audience awake and engaged, our format today will be a rapid fire series of six presentations, each lasting no more than 30 minutes. We'll have a question and answer session at the completion of the final presentation. And to keep us on schedule, I'm going to really ask that you hold off on asking questions until then. And the speakers, uh, uh, those who can, will be around as long as you like uh, after, afterwards to answer questions or visit. We're committed to getting everyone out of here on time for lunch and the rest of your Saturday. There will be a refreshment break after our first three talks. My name is Brian Sayers. I'm chair of the Physician Health and Rehabilitation Committee and the Physician Wellness Program Steering Committee. I've practiced rheumatology in Austin for the past 31 years, and if you can make it through my presentation here at the beginning, you'll be just fine. <laughs> the program today has an ambitious title. I'm taken by the concept of True North, both its cultural and scientific meanings, that with just a little imagination have great applications to our calling in medicine. In one sense, True North is the direction we are drawn to in our calling, a place of meaning and hope and purpose. We may start out our lives in medicine with the idea that this will be a straight and idyllic road to a beautiful wide horizon of meaning and purpose. We soon learn that it is a winding road, the end obscured from view, but we sense that the twists and turns are an adventure that will make the road to true north even more exciting. But for some of us, at times it might look more like this, and instead of heading north, we find ourselves lost on one of those off-ramps there at the bottom. Three things happen on that off-ramp. First, we're slow to realize that we're no longer headed north, but instead are lost. Second, we might take even longer to admit it to ourselves and to our passengers. And last, especially familiar to us if the driver is male, we're extremely reluctant to stop and ask for directions. <clears throat> 
The scientific definition of true north describes it as the direction along the Earth's surface that leads to the North Pole, the precise northern axis that the world rotates upon. It differs from magnetic north, the direction that magnetic compasses point to. Magnetic compasses are deflected by invisible forces pulled away from true north. A variety of magnetic fields flow around the Earth's surface, unseen, which combined with natural and man-made objects near our compass, draw the compass slightly away from true north. In fact, the magnetic north pole moves from year to year, and as you approach the Arctic Circle, closing in on your destination, your magnetic compass may actually point south rather than north. Following magnetic, following magnetic north will inevitably lead you away from true north, even ancient mariners realized this and used an unwavering astronomical marker, Polaris, the North Star, to keep true north in sight wherever they sailed to avoid being pulled off course. True north can be seen as the internal compass that guides us successfully through life. It is our ethical and moral certainties. For some, our faith. It is our fixed point in a world that tries to pull us off course, where even a few degrees can eventually lead us far from our true north. In the limited context of medicine, true north can be things like meaning, service, and engagement. Engagement with our patients, our colleagues, and all of humanity. But in our lives as physicians, there are many things that can draw us away from true north, invisible forces that can progressively pull us in directions away from our original goal. One of the challenges in our professional careers is to realize when we have strayed off course, to look for the cause and for possible solutions. When we are unable to do that for ourselves, I believe it is our moral obligation for us and our colleagues as a community to help our struggling or fallen colleagues find their way back to true north. That is one of the basic concepts of our physician wellness program. Our lives in medicine start out with wonder, amazement, and fearlessness, only to risk somehow losing those feelings. Drawn to medicine unjaded with innocence and curiosity, confident and eager, but at high risk for finding ourselves struggling rather than thriving. I want to say a few words about burnout, not because y'all haven't read about this, and I'm going to go through it pretty quickly, but I want to kind of get us all on the same playing field and the same mindset as we start all of our talks today. Burnout has three components. It's a syndrome of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a sense of low personal accomplishment that leads to decreased effectiveness at work. A deterioration of values, spirit, and will, and famously described as an erosion of the soul. So many contributing factors uh, fit in here, many of which you've heard. Um, most physicians have certain personality traits that uh, enabled us to get as far as we did in our careers as we started. Compulsive and perfectionist are a couple of them that actually can help us to function well as physicians to a certain point but have a profound destructive potential as well. We have lives outside of medical practice, at least I think we do, and those stressors can come into the workplace as well. Loss of control is a big one. We have certainly, in many ways, lost control of medicine, lost control of the way we practice, who we practice with, whether our values are being um, shared, and this loss of control can be really disorienting, sometimes disheartening, as the poet Rilke described, as if standing on fishes, this disorientation can be. 
there's a sense of betrayal. We came into medicine thinking that certain things would be the case, that certain promises were made that would help us to have good careers and to take good care of people. And when those things are taken away, there's a sense of betrayal. Unrealistic expectations, especially our own definition of what success should look like in our medical careers. Physicians are certainly less likely to seek help. Physical exhaustion and sleep deprivation often figure in, especially during the training years. Lack of quiet time should probably be closer to the top of this list. Deterioration, lack of nurturing of personal relationships resulting in isolation is often a contributing factor. And increasingly systems issues, administrative and technical demands on us is being recognized more and more as contributing factors. So there's really sort of two concepts of where burnout comes from. There's a traditional concept that was mostly on this last uh, slide, physician's personality traits and certain kinds of indoctrination during our training, which we're all familiar with, is the traditional concept of where burnout really starts and why we're at risk for it. The evolving concept that really fills the medical literature about burnout now is a look at how the systems that physicians operate in lead to burnout. Not just the notorious EMR, but our loss of control, production targets that might determine not only our employment status, but our incomes, lack of time spent in meaningful work during a work day, and progressively a loss of sense of community within the medical profession. The consequences of burnout you're familiar with as well, depression. It turns out that physicians, among the other things that they're skilled at, uh, suicide. Um, there's a much higher rate of suicide in physicians than the general population, particularly female physicians. And we're really good at suicide. It tends to be much more successful in physicians than in the general population. Health problems, sleep disturbance, substance abuse, divorce and shattered relationships, accidents and early retirement from medical practices are all potential consequences. As chair of the Physician Health and Rehabilitation Committee, some of these endpoints we see regularly on our committee and wish that there could be some intervention at an earlier stage before they end up with our committee with their um, livelihood and careers uh, threatened. Increasingly in the medical literature, in addition to burnout, there are somewhat related uh, topics that are distinctly different but still related, compassion fatigue and second victim syndrome, at least some of which we'll talk about today. So we hope that our lives in medicine will be blue skies and a constant course to true north, and I wish that for all of you. But we know that often, Statistics would say somewhere around half of us, at some point, it just won't work out that way. Things happen that we can't control and often can't explain. We might stumble, or worse, sometimes privately from within and sometimes very publicly. I was taken with this slide when I was putting this together, but it worked on me a little bit after the fact when I noticed the audience. So this poor skater who's trying to pull herself up after this terrible accident, there's this audience around her that are just kind of staring at her. Some have their mouth, mouths open. You can see they know she's suffering, but you don't see one person in the audience getting up to help her. And this is a metaphor for medicine and its fallen physicians, I think. As a community of colleagues, we have seen great need to keep our community whole, and from that vision, we are constructing a framework for pulling our community closer together, and in doing so, caring for each other in the truest sense of the word. So about a year and a half ago, um, one of our uh, medical society staff members, uh, Belinda, um, was familiar with a program up in Eugene, Oregon that had just started uh, that sort of was changing the face of um, wellness programs in county medical societies. 
And we started looking at wellness programs around the country, uh, the ones that we thought were good and the ones that we thought we could learn a lot from. The first thing that we noticed was that typical wellness and resilience programs, uh, one of which we, we have, uh, some of parts of which we have done over the years here in the medical society, uh, do certain things. And they're good things. They describe the problem. They describe the root causes of burnout. They warn about the consequences. They suggest solutions, and these are powerful solutions. Mindfulness, work-life integration, exercise, rest, attention to our health, social interaction, spiritual and contemplative practices, and hobbies, interests outside of medicine. The format is more often lecture than discussion, and there's nothing wrong with that. We're doing that today. The limitation from that, though, is that a lot of those programs, when you walk out of the lecture hall, that's sort of it. You've learned a lot. You may have learned some things that are even practical, but taking it another step is often missing. So what's missing from these programs? Well, we decided that one of the main things that was missing was crisis intervention and how we could do that as a medical society. Attention to offending systems is rarely taken on. Maybe the problem is more the practice environment than the fundamental problem with the people who are placed in it. What do we do about that with hospital systems, large group practices, even the systems problems that affect small practices? What do we do about those? How can we as a medical society try to make that better? What's often missing is uh, interpersonal interactions, reinforcement and support that is built into the programs and rebuilding of a sense of community in a 4,000 member medical society that is spread out so much and often finds many of its members isolated within their own community. So our, our uh, medical society uh, program uh, started off with two basic components, an educational component, which does the standard things, promote awareness, removes the stigma of discussing burnout and physician challenges, provides practical strategies. We want to look at systems realignment as well things that have to do with uh, physicians in the workplace, how they might control their schedules, the people they work with, their employer. Really try to look at that and have a, have a community-wide conversation about that that involves the employers. And offer a variety of, of offerings, not just CME programs, but we want to have a strong emphasis on workshops. Um, Dr. Uh, Vu Wallace will talk about one she's doing later. Uh, we want to have a strong small group component. Small groups is where physicians will really talk about challenges, really open up and share ideas with each other, much more so than in a room like this. Importantly, the unique part of our program is its intervention program. We call it a coaching program, mostly for medical legal reasons. It's really a counseling program. We wanted to have some key components in it to make it easy for doctors to want to access the program. Anonymity, lack of reportability to credentialing and licensing bodies, ease of access, lack of financial barriers, and peer-driven rather than employer-controlled. When we were looking at our coaching program, there were key issues that we needed to address based on conversations with physicians and other medical societies about why doctors didn't access counseling programs, particularly their own employee assistance programs within their group practices or hospital systems. As I mentioned earlier, there's a fear that anything that has to do with mental health issues might be reported to the state board somehow. We all have a general idea that we fill out forms for credentialing every now and then and it asks us some kind of questions about whether there's a problem that we've been getting help for that might impair our ability to practice medicine fear of consequences to hospital staff privileges, and fear of employment consequences. A lot of people just won't access available employee uh, assistance programs because they're afraid that there's not a strong firewall there between them and their employer. Fear of discovery by peers. There's still a stigma in many ways associated with physicians seeking help. As a member of the Physician Health and Rehabilitation Committee, one of the things that needed to be addressed, in my opinion, was the lack of early intervention that might lead to larger problems. We wanted to start things downstream. 
and we wanted to make sure that all of this is administered by peer advocates, not by employers. So the way our, our counseling program is set up uh, is there's a series of steps that protects the physician at every stage. First of all, there's easy access and anonymity. Physicians can call our 24-hour hotline and one of our medical society staff will answer the phone. One of the first things they'll do is ask that the physician not identify themselves. They might ask for uh, or get, without asking, a thumbnail sketch of what the problem is that the physician is needing addressed and suggest one of our counselors, or they may direct them to the website to look at the biographies of the counselors that we have and select one for themselves. We do not make the appointments for them. We ask them to contact the counselor directly. They'll just call and identify themselves as members of a TCMS who needs an appointment. Um, the counselors um, are the only ones who ever know the, um, the physician's identity. They send us uh, an invoice at the end of each month that gives us non-identifiable demographics so we can keep track of that. We ask the physician to access it if they're willing to, to send us an anonymous uh, evaluation form so we'll know how we're doing. But again, their um, identity is protected from their peers and from the medical society staff for that matter. Our counselors are carefully vetted. We got suggestions from a number of people in our medical society and then a committee of three of us went and, in, and interviewed them at their place of business to see what their facilities were like and to have an extended interview with them about how they approached counseling of medical professionals as opposed to uh, other parts of their practice. There's some legal issues here that we wanted to um, make sure about in order to make some certain assurances to physicians. We call these coaching sessions for a reason. We ask the counselors not to produce a medical record that has a diagnosis applied or a treatment plan attached. It's more of a conversation and problem solving uh, session uh, is the way we present it. Uh, but they're counseling professionals, they're psychologists, and they know what they're doing. It's not reportable or discoverable unless the physician is a danger to themselves or to others. We have legal opinions both locally and by way of other medical societies to make sure that this is the case. There's no charge for the initial visits. We provide four free visits for anyone accessing the program, both because some physicians have a concern that there will be a paper trail of uh, a financial trail leading to a counselor, and also because some of our physicians, especially those who are really in trouble, have financial issues that really acts as a barrier. The counselors that we have, uh, their offices are basically away from um, normal practice settings in the sense that there's not a lot of physician offices around where they practice, and the, uh, and the sessions do take place in their offices, not at our medical society offices and there's flexible scheduling time. They can be seen within 24 hours, and there's evening visits available as well so that there's not the stress of having to cancel your clinic to go get your counseling session. So all of these, we think, are safeguards that, make, that uh, take down most of the barriers that, um, that physicians have that keep them from getting help. We encourage spouses to access the program, and that's another unique part of our program. Uh, we all know how important um, our spouses are, our life partners for how we function in the workplace. We don't just offer counseling for work-related problems, but anything, marital problems, mood disturbances, stress from malpractice litigation, problems with alcohol or drugs, anything that affects people's functioning as a human being, which in turn affects their functioning uh, as a physician. We have very limited data. We just launched in August, and so we have August and September data. And in the first eight weeks, we had five participants access the program, including one couple, 14 visits so far. Our limited demographics at this point is that everyone has been under age 55, and there's almost an even mix with uh, gender and uh, practice setting and practice type. All three counselors have been accessed, and so far our evaluations have all been very positive. Data from the uh, few 
medical societies uh, in the Pacific Northwest who have a program like this would say that uh, in, in one place where there had been some physician suicides, uh, fully 8% of their medical society accessed this program. Um, more than half of the people who access these programs are in group practices or a hospital practice or employer setting where there is an employee assistance program that offers counseling that they choose to avoid because of firewall concerns. And so um, we are um, trying to get the word out about our counseling or coaching program. I really hope that if anybody in this room thinks you can benefit from it or your spouse can, that you will access the program. If you have any colleagues who you think it might be useful for, please encourage them to uh, access the program. At this point, we have funding to carry us uh, well beyond uh, the next 12 months. And we're uh, very optimistic that this will um, be a highly utilized uh, program that we can offer our members. So again, two main components, our safe harbor component and then our educational program. We have the, uh, the educational programs, uh, nationally known speakers. We had Ronald Epstein, the author of Attending, which is a great book you should read if you haven't. Uh, with us in September, we'll have CME um, meetings like this. This uh, During October, uh, we started launching our small groups. Um, we had four planned and two of them started meeting last month um, and I got to go to both of them and uh, help organize them. Uh, we had really good groups. One, one of them was a discussion group where we had a palliative care specialist and an oncologist and we talked about the challenges of uh, treating people at the end of life and people who are chronically ill. Um, in another group, we talked about the challenges of um, what happens when you're uh, treating patients and things go wrong. Where each of these four groups takes a um, really a, a different approach and I hope that you'll look at our website and look at them and choose one that you might be interested in. Um, and then we have workshops and retreats. Um, again, Dr. Vu Wallace will tell you about hers and she's been um, working in parallel with us uh, to offer this to our, to our members. So uh, check out all of this on the website. We have a lot of um, electronic offerings also, a lot of videos that you might be interested in, uh, book recommendations, articles. Uh, we have a, uh, a monthly blog that we hope helps uh, uh, in a couple of minutes uh, stimulate some thoughts. So please check it out and um, find something that's useful for you, I hope. So we're very proud of the program that we're developing for this medical community. I hope that you'll review the materials that we've given you today, look over our web pages, and take advantage of some of our offerings. PWP is a self-supporting program. It doesn't use your medical society dues at all. It depends on your tax-deductible donations. Donation information is available on our website, and there's a donation card in your program materials today, and I know a lot of you uh, have already uh, left us a card. Um, when you're leaving, make sure that you put the card in the hand of um, one of our medical society staff rather than just laying it around on a table, and we'll protect your identity and credit card number if you trust us with it. Uh, talk to your colleagues about our program, and um, uh, if you want to participate in the program, uh, get in touch with me, and we'll put you on the committee. We love to hear ideas. We've got a great committee. Some of the members are here today who have really helped us put together the program and uh, ideas going forward. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who's our co-host today. Dr. Carrie Barron. Carrie is Assistant Professor of Psychiatry and Director of the Creativity for Resilience Program, Dell Medical School. Carrie has been a great supporter of our physician wellness program and her creativity and advice have been much appreciated. Okay, okay, good. Um, so 
Thanks so much, Dr. Sayers, for inviting me here today to work with this great group. And I'm, I know a few of you, and I'd love to know more of you, and it's just really an honor to have you here at Dell Medical School. Um, and I'll just jump in. Um, let's see. Okay. Well, while they're getting me set up, I'm gonna, I would like to tell you a little story about myself. Um, when I was 12, I wasn't such a good kid. And I was wandering around the high school doing a lot of things I shouldn't have been doing at night. And it was dark and I was alone. And um, so I heard this sound coming from the auditorium, this music, and I followed it and I went in and I sat in the back row of the auditorium and it was the eighth grade choir singing classical music. And I was very perplexed because it was mesmerizing and it calmed me down. So a few months later, there were auditions for the seventh grade play, Lil Abner. And to my surprise, I got the role of Daisy May in Lil Abner. The choir director came to the show and he said, he invited me to join the choir and he said, you need to take voice lessons and I'm gonna have you audition with Mrs. Tung. She was a dental hygienist and also the local voice teacher. <laughs> so um, my first lesson with Mrs. Tung she had me lay down on this beige wall-to-wall -wall carpet. It was the 70s. I remember I had this red flannel shirt that I'd gotten for Christmas that I had really coveted. Anyway, so she had me do an exercise where she put three heavy books on my abdomen. And she said, on the count of five, raise the books, hold them for five, and lower them for five. She said, this is what singing is about. You connect the voice to the breath. And then she stood behind me and she put her hands very close, almost hugging me on my abdomen. And she said, expand your diaphragm and hold it. And now let it tone out. And she said, the tone rides on the breath when you're letting the breath out very slowly. And she said, after time and after practice, you're gonna get a very tingly, airy, light feeling in your body. And there's gonna be a buzzy resonance on the top of your mouth if you're doing it correctly. So I studied classical voice for 20 years and then had a child and other things happened and so I wasn't singing anymore. But then I started taking yoga classes a few years ago. And what I found in the yoga classes was that it was the same feeling with the breath. And the other thing about the yoga classes is that sometimes people would play music in them and if I love the music, I love the class. And if I didn't love the music, the class was grating. So I've been wondering, having taken mindfulness meditation classes and thought about a lot of different ways into wellness, what about singing? What about music? And I've, in the last 10 days, suddenly become obsessed with the topic. So I completely changed my talk. Um, however, I will tell you that I think we can all intuitively see the connection between compassion and music being in a very feeling, emotional state. And um, I think in, at Adele, and what I'm very interested in, have been for a long time, I wrote a book about creativity five years ago with my husband, making, doing the arts and humanities have a lot to do with entering a self and entering a state that's very connected to compassion, feeling, feeling present and full experience of living. So that's what I wanna talk about today, and, and, and another thing I wanted to, just, so I'm gonna throw you some tidbits of medicine and music that I thought were really interesting, but one really interesting thing that came up in my reading was that a study was done wherein people administered 43% less of their pain medication, self-administered, if they were listening to music of their choice. So anyway, let's go through and So to start, let's have a meditative moment with Mozart. Let's see if I'm doing this correctly. Here, let's try it one more time. And the sound. Let's see. Thank <laughs> you. 
Good morning. Go and take your seats. We're going to get started here on time, I hope. Okay, welcome everybody. We're going to try to stay on schedule here this morning, so we'll go ahead and get started as uh, folks keep filtering in. So on behalf of the Travis County Medical Society Physician Wellness Program, I want to welcome you all to our first wellness symposium. I want to thank our co-host, Dr. Carrie Barron, who helped us uh, secure the spot here and um, help us get ready for today, uh, Dell Medical School, uh, our TCMS staff, um, I want to really thank them. They're in the back. Raise your hands. And Good morning. Go and take your seats. We're going to get started here on time, I hope. Okay, welcome everybody. We're going to try to stay on schedule here this morning, so we'll go ahead and get started as uh, folks keep filtering in. So on behalf of the Travis County Medical Society Physician Wellness Program, I want to welcome you all to our first wellness symposium. I want to thank our co-host, Dr. Carrie Barron, who helped us uh, secure the spot here and um, help us get ready for today, uh, Dell Medical School, uh, our TCMS staff. Um, I want to really thank them. They're in the back. Raise your hands and uh, everybody give them. Good. They've worked really hard, full-time uh, medical society staff and uh, part-time caterers or uh, something. Anyway, they've worked really hard to get this together tonight. Today, we're, we're trying to do this on a budget, and so uh, we did the catering ourselves, and, and actually, they did the catering themselves, so we really appreciate that. Um, all of our speakers, I really appreciate you being here today. Uh, CME notification. This symposium has been accredited for three Category 1 credits and three credits in the area of ethics and or professional responsibility. To receive credit, you will fill out a CME form that is in your packet. Um, turn it in at the end of the program. When completing the form, put your participation hours in the Category 1 credit column and in the ethics credit column. Turn in the white copy and keep the yellow copy. This is kind of like where they show you how to use a seat belt on an airplane, I think. Um, please take a moment to complete and turn in the evaluation form as well. So anyway, please just turn in the forms on your way out and I'll try to remind you at the end also. In an effort to keep our Saturday morning audience awake and engaged, our format today will be a rapid fire series of six presentations, each lasting no more than 30 minutes. We'll have a question and answer session at the completion of the final presentation. And to keep us on schedule, I'm gonna really ask that you hold off on asking questions until then. And the speakers, uh, uh, those who can, will be around as long as you like uh, after, afterwards to answer questions or visit. We're committed to getting everyone out of here on time for lunch and the rest of your Saturday. There will be a refreshment break after our first three talks. My name is Brian Sayers. I'm chair of the Physician Health and Rehabilitation Committee and the Physician Wellness Program Steering Committee. I've practiced rheumatology in Austin for the past 31 years. And if you can make it through my presentation here at the beginning, you'll be just fine. <laughs> the program today has an ambitious title. I'm taken by the concept of True North, both its cultural and scientific meanings that with just a little imagination have great applications to our calling in medicine. In one sense, True North is the direction we are drawn to in our calling, a place of meaning and hope and purpose. 
We may start out our lives in medicine with the idea that this will be a straight and idyllic road to a beautiful wide horizon of meaning and purpose. We soon learn that it is a winding road, the end obscured from view, but we sense that the twists and turns are an adventure that will make the road to true north even more exciting. But for some of us, at times it might look more like this, and instead of heading north, we find ourselves lost on one of those off-ramps there at the bottom. Three things happen on that off-ramp. First, we're slow to realize that we're no longer headed north, but instead are lost. Second, we might take even longer to admit it to ourselves and to our passengers. And last, especially familiar to us if the driver is male, we're extremely reluctant to stop and ask for directions. <clears throat> the scientific definition of true north describes it as the direction along the Earth's surface that leads to the North Pole, the precise northern axis that the world rotates upon. It differs from magnetic north, the direction that magnetic compasses point to. Magnetic compasses are deflected by invisible forces pulled away from true north. A variety of magnetic fields flow around the Earth's surface, unseen, which combined with natural and man-made objects near our compass, draw the compass slightly away from true north. In fact, the magnetic North Pole moves from year to year, and as you approach the Arctic Circle, closing in on your destination, your magnetic compass may actually point south rather than north. Following magnetic, following magnetic north will inevitably lead you away from true north. Even ancient mariners realized this and used an unwavering astronomical marker, Polaris, the North Star, to keep true north in sight wherever they sailed to avoid being pulled off course. True north can be seen as the internal compass that guides us successfully through life. It is our ethical and moral certainties. For some, our faith. It is our fixed point in a world that tries to pull us off course, where even a few degrees can eventually lead us far from our true north. In the limited context of medicine, true north can be things like meaning, service, and engagement. Engagement with our patients, our colleagues, and all of humanity. But in our lives as physicians, there are many things that can draw us away from true north. Invisible forces that can progressively pull us in directions away from our original goal. One of the challenges in our professional careers is to realize when we have strayed off course, to look for the cause and for possible solutions. When we are unable to do that for ourselves, I believe it is our moral obligation for us and our colleagues as a community to help our struggling or fallen colleagues find their way back to true north. That is one of the basic concepts of our physician wellness program. Our lives in medicine start out with wonder, amazement, and fearlessness, only to risk somehow losing those feelings. Drawn to medicine unjaded with innocence and curiosity, confident and eager, but at high risk for finding ourselves struggling rather than thriving. I want to say a few words about burnout, not because you all haven't read about this, and I'm going to go through it pretty quickly, but I want to kind of get us all on the same playing field and the same mindset as we start all of our talks today. Burnout has three components. It's a syndrome of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a sense of low personal accomplishment that leads to decreased effectiveness at work. A deterioration of values, spirit, and will, 
and famously described as an erosion of the soul. So many contributing factors uh, fit in here, many of which you've heard. Um, most physicians have certain personality traits that uh, enabled us to get as far as we did in our careers as we started. Compulsive and perfectionist are a couple of them that actually can help us to function well as physicians to a certain point, but have a profound destructive potential as well. We have lives outside of medical practice, at least I think we do, and those stressors can come into the workplace as well. Loss of control is a big one. We have certainly, in many ways, lost control of medicine, lost control of the way we practice, who we practice with, whether our values are being um, shared. And this loss of control can be really disorienting, sometimes disheartening. As the poet Rilke described, as if standing on fishes, this disorientation can be. There's a sense of betrayal. We came into medicine thinking that certain things would be the case, that certain promises were made that would help us to have good careers and to take good care of people. And when those things are taken away, there's a sense of betrayal. Unrealistic expectations, especially our own definition of what success should look like in our medical careers. Physicians are certainly less likely to seek help. Physical exhaustion and sleep deprivation often figure in, especially during the training years. Lack of quiet time should probably be closer to the top of this list. Deterioration, lack of nurturing of personal relationships resulting in isolation is often a contributing factor. And increasingly systems issues, administrative and technical demands on us is being recognized more and more as contributing factors. So there's really sort of two concepts of where burnout comes from. There's a traditional concept that was mostly on this last uh, slide, physicians' personality traits and certain kinds of indoctrination during our training, which we're all familiar with, is the traditional concept of where burnout really starts and why we're at risk for it. The evolving concept that really fills the medical literature about burnout now is a look at how the systems that physicians operate in lead to burnout. Not just the notorious EMR, but our loss of control, production targets that might determine not only our employment status, but our incomes, lack of time spent in meaningful work during a work day, and progressive. Were my bitter, tainted, trembling lips with melody deep, clear, and liquid slow. Oh, for the healing swaying, old and low, of some song sung to rest the tired dead, a song to fall like water on my head, and over quivering limbs dreamed, flushed to glow. There is a magic made by melody, a spell of rest and quiet breath and cool heart that sinks through fading colors deep to the subaqueous stillness of the sea and floats forever in a moon green pool held in the arms of rhythm and of sleep. So just another tidbit, um, Dr. Charles Lim tested uh, jazz musicians when they were playing, when they were playing by rote as opposed to improvising, when they were improvising, the pleasure centers just lit up. So there's something about your unstructured day not being overly programmed. I mean, this is consistent with what psychologists have written about the unfocused mind, spontaneous thought. So I, I'm just trying to point out what we can be aware of. We may not be able to control our circumstances all the time, but it is good to have some play or unstructured time in your day. Um, I found a, a great TED talk about Gershwin, who was apparently a terrible child, a, a hellion, and he got into a lot of trouble. But when he found music and he had this kind of rat tat 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 you know, in his music and jazz, it was using his hyperkinetic self um, to create the music. So uh, we'll do one more um, exercise. And I just want to say I'm going to ask you to ask, answer these questions. And work, play, and love. Emotional health is based on work, play, and love. This comes from Freud to Frankel to current thinkers. 
Do you have a purpose or a calling? If you have one person or five people or 70 people in your life that you can depend on and that love and care for you, and if you have some time to play or just do what you feel like doing, you're going to be okay. So if you, I would just take about three minutes to answer these questions. It's okay, we have a few more minutes. Do you want to keep going? Okay. So, does anybody need more time? No? Okay. Um, the reason I put that question in, the reason I put that question in about um, what's going to get in your way, I found that this research recently um, from NYU, which is basically psychoanalysis in, in four easy steps. <laughs> because if you if you don't know the obstacle to your wish or your dream or your goal, if you don't deal with your resistance, um, it uh, it's really important for liberation. So I would just put that there and think about that. So the next thing um, is let's just talk for a few minutes with each other. We have a few more minutes about your song, your two favorite songs, and why, and, and you can just ask each other these questions. If you had the time to write down your a soothing song and a cheering song. Thank you. 
So we'll just take another 30 seconds to to wrap up that conversation. Okay, so um, just in the interest of time, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up the conversation. And um, this is a, a, a someone sent me this from the New Yorker, which is uh, basically um, arts and humanities. They do a lot for us. So finally, um, I just wanted to to end in the last few minutes. Um, Jung, as you're very familiar with, is a psychoanalyst. He was having some kind of struggle, and he tried to reach into his deepest self, and he made this art. It's in the Red Book, really beautiful art. And I just wanted to show you a few of his paintings as we end. And I'm going to just do something really random that I thought of. Poor Brian, I keep calling and changing what I'm going to do. But um, yesterday I was driving my son to school, and for some reason my son listens to music for, from the 60s and 70s, and I'm always trying to find a song he doesn't know. Well, he, does, he knows all of them. So yesterday he played a song for me and in the car, and I thought, what is that? What is, what is that, Sentimental Journey, Sentimental Wing? He said, no, Mom, it's Sentimental Lady. And I remember it was from 1977, and I never really remembered, I don't know, loving that song, but um, it, for some reason it just hit me, and I just wanted to play it. Good morning. Go and take your seats. We're going to get started here on time, I hope. Okay, welcome everybody. We're going to try to stay on schedule here this morning, so we'll go ahead and get started as uh, folks keep filtering in. So on behalf of the Travis County Medical Society Physician Wellness Program, I want to welcome you all to our first wellness symposium. I want to thank our co-host, Dr. Carrie Barron, who helped us uh, secure the spot here and um, help us get ready for today, uh, Dell Medical School, uh, our TCMS staff, um, I want to really thank them. They're in the back. Raise your hands and uh, everybody give them. Good. They've worked really hard, full time uh, medical society staff and uh, part time caterers or uh, something. Anyway, they've worked really hard to get this together tonight. Today, we're, we're trying to do this on a budget, and so uh, we did the catering ourselves, and, and actually, they did the catering themselves, so we really appreciate that. Um, all of our speakers, I really appreciate you being here today. Uh, CME notification. This symposium has been accredited for three Category 1 credits and three credits in the area of ethics and or professional responsibility. To receive credit, you will fill out a CME form that is in your packet. Um, turn it in at the end of the program. When completing the form, put your participation hours in the Category 1 credit column and in the Ethics credit column. Turn in the white copy and keep the yellow copy. This is kind of like where they show you how to use a seat belt on an airplane, I think. Um, please take a moment to complete and turn in the evaluation form as well. 
So anyway, please just turn in the forms on your way out, and I'll try to remind you at the end also. In an effort to keep our Saturday morning audience awake and engaged, our format today will be a rapid-fire series of six presentations, each lasting no more than 30 minutes. We'll have a question and answer session at the completion of the final presentation, and to keep us on schedule, I'm going to really ask that you hold off on asking questions until then. And the speakers, uh, uh, those who can, will be around as long as you like uh, after, afterwards to answer questions or visit. We're committed. Okay, thank you very much. That was great. Super. Our next speaker is uh, Don Seri. Dawn serves as Director of Healthcare Ethics at the Seton Family of Healthcare. Her work includes developing and implementing interdisciplinary educational plans for 11 different ethics communities within the Seton family. She received her BSN and master's degrees in nursing and healthcare and a PhD in bioethics from Loyola University. Dawn. Good morning, everybody. So it's been an elegant morning already, thinking about burnout, resilience, the call to be here is part of what we're going to be thinking about the rest of this morning. And I'm going to take us now into some other dimensions that have to do with this concern that we've brought forward. I want to thank Brian and the rest of the management team this opportunity. So your learning, you're already aware. It's just all over the literature nowadays in terms of burnout and the things that are happening to us. This comes from the Mayo Clinic proceedings, so really a really comprehensive report about the problem and the concerns for burnout and resilience. But I want you to think about yourself right now. And I want you to think about your colleagues. This is a delicate balance. This is head and heart, compassion and empathy, logic. These are the things that we know right now are happening amongst us, amongst our health care professionals. Perhaps there are parts of this that you can identify in yourself or in another. But these are reasons why we do that. We can begin to think about not only from the personal side, but on the professional side. Thank you. So as the Director of Ethics, I am called on a regular basis for a physician who's in struggling mode, thinking about, I have a problem and I need help. And I need to talk about that and think about what I'm gonna do. And the majority of the problems seem to come from that side that's the professional. However, as we begin to move into what is this ethical concern, the personal comes into view. And that personal and professional cannot be separated any more than you can take your skin off. You're not able to pull away a person from a professional because you are that professional who is a person first. Right now we understand the dimensions that drive burnout and resilience to be this cluster. Now again, I want you to think about you right now in your role and look at this cluster and think about where is it impacting you the most? Beginning on the top, thinking about your workload and job demands, the lack of control or perhaps the control that you have and the flexibility in that. How well do you integrate your work and life balance? What kinds of social support? What kind of community do that you have at work? Brian has already talked about the fact that the need for community becomes an imperative as we begin to think through this. We have organizational culture and values, and all of you work within probably more than one organization, and perhaps from organization to organization, you begin to sense differences in values, differences in approach, and the different pressures that come upon you, depending on the organization that you're in. What about that workflow impacts you? Are you efficient? Are you effective? Do you have the right resources? And then again, back to that whole workload and job demand piece that weighs on you. 
But in the center of all of that is the meaning, the purpose, the calling, the need to answer that call is what you became a physician for. Where are you in still thinking about meaning and purpose? If you've lost some of that sense because of all of these other dimensions, you're probably leaning towards or maybe even already into that burnout, which we know can cause your exhaustion, being a cynic, being ineffective or inefficient in your work, or perhaps you've built that safety net to think about, no, I'm going to remain engaged. I'm going to have that vigor. I'm going to enter every new day as an adventure inside my relationships and my profession. I'm remaining dedicated. I'm not questioning, why am I still doing this? And I am absorbed in what I do, but I'm able still to have a balance. So we're going to think about these kinds of inner dimensions and outer dimensions, the influences inside an organization, but through the lens of ethics. Now, all of you have, during your lifetime and your education, have been introduced to ethics. But I want to give you some different ways to think about ethics. For me, ethics is about my actions in light of my identity. And how many identities do I have? I certainly have a professional identity in my background, 30 plus years of critical care nursing before I became a doctor of bioethics. But I'm also a wife, a mother, a grandmother, a member of a big community. And there are lots of ways I think about my actions in light of my identity. And perhaps I'm in one identity versus in another identity. But I want you to consider ethics in this bigger circle of, it is really a study, it's a branch of philosophy, but it's about our moral lives, that rightness and wrongness, that moral life and the actions, and how our actions actually affect ourselves and others. Our challenge is to think about the ethics of our actions and how what we are doing about burnout and resilience and taking care of ourselves, not only impacts ourselves and our immediate cir circle of friends and family, but what does that do to our relationship with our patients? And how the morality of that relationship is now suffering because of what you are suffering from. So there are three components to these actions then. And most of us live inside two and rarely think about the third. So I'm talking about that tension between head and heart right now. The first is doing. It is about how I'm supposed to, what, is, what am I ought to do in my actions when I'm in a relationship with another. And I'm going to focus right now on that other as being the patient, that person that is the center of your moral action as a professional. So I'm about doing we all know we have to do things. And part of my concern right now is medicine is moving away from a profession into being challenged to becoming a commodity. Between metrics and all of the things that we have to report every day to show we've finished our load and we're not impacting the bottom line, I'm worried that medicine is moving away from its calling to becoming a commodity, something that somebody just pays for and you are suffering as a result of that. It's pulling you away from that original calling that you have. So think about doing and then apply being. Doing being. Being is who you ought to become as a person. When you came into medicine, you thought about what you ought to do as a physician. You were prepared. How many of you really stepped out, though, once you stepped away from that relatively protected role of a medical student and a resident into the cold, cruel world of you are on your own now? But weren't you really, from the very beginning, told you're on your own? Don't rely on anybody else. It's up to you to make sure the lab work is done, the x-ray is done, that patient gets the procedures done, that patient gets out within the length of stay that you're allowed to keep a patient in the hospital for. So is now being and doing challenged with this idea that I am a commodity. I am not a calling. I am not a profession. I am a commodity, and I'm being tasked to get my work done. 
Now, I had the third element of this idea of lives and actions and the moral notion of what you're here called to do, and that is to care. Caring is about that very special promise that you took from the very beginning that says, I will come from a place of compassion and aid to help another. That other right now is this patient we're talking about. But think of all of you as the other that you're intended to also help. That sense of community that helps you get through a very bad day and into the next one. Caring is a, that true act of a profession. Yes, there is a part that says I have to deny myself in order to care for the needs of another. Because the ultimate good we're headed for is the good for that patient that you're in a relationship with. And the struggle becomes then what I think is good for that patient. That patient doesn't necessarily agree with. And how do I help my heart and my head come to grips with this fact that I have things I'm supposed to do, but I have a being that says, this doesn't feel right, and I am supposed to care about this, and yet this is the what number of patient who's you've heard this story over and over again, and here comes another one who's not going to be compliant, who's not going to follow your directions, or a family member who's done everything that on Google and has challenged you that Google says it do it this way, and yet you want to do it that way, and all the things that you struggle with every day, that you end up beginning to feel like my actions in light of my consequences are directly pitted against what the community or this person or actually even our nation is beginning to think about medicine. You're hired technicians. You're just to come do take what I want you to do and to leave me alone. And there to me is beginning the crux of the problem that I see in terms of burnout and resilience. You are being asked to do things and in such a technical manner and being held accountable for all those technical things that you're doing that we're losing sense of meaning, purpose, caring, those relationships. And those relationships are broken clearly within the hospitals because I get calls all the time from patients who are saying, what is this thing called a hospitalist? Why don't I have my doctor here taking care of me? And we have strangers taking care of strangers. And if you think about the morality of the work that you are called to do, it begins with relationships. And how can you build a relationship that quickly with a stranger who is supposed to trust you and communicate with you and be with you on this journey back to healing. So what then does ethics require of us? If this is about my actions in light of my consequences, and those consequences will be on me, but they're also going to be on the patient, they're going to be on the family, they're certainly going to be on the organization, and organization has a commitment to make sure that it does not impact your integrity. And if that organization can't meet that commitment, then we need to talk about what the organization is doing to harm you or to help you in its original calling to also provide for healing. So ethics requires, first of all, your freedom to make choices, because that's about that being and doing. But it is also about, inside those choices, having the knowledge to think through what ought I to do right now and to have enough knowledge to make a fully informed consent. I know all of you can tell a story about a patient that you wondered if they really ever understood the consequences of what they just said yes to, or perhaps even no to, because they lacked the knowledge, they lacked the picture of what they needed to do. How many of our colleagues lack some of that knowledge that's driving them into the burnout? And perhaps through our lenses, we can say that ethical duty is at risk right now. So beyond freedom and knowledge, what's next? Reasoning and discernment. You certainly spent a lot of time in school and out thinking about reasoning and discernment. But it is part of why ethics becomes this thing that we really need to bring back into center stage. It's constant, ongoing reflection about those values that brought you into medicine in the first place and how those values are constant in interaction and how organizations help to either uphold or destroy 
or minimize those values in your relationships with your patients and your colleagues. Ultimately, ethics requires us to toggle constantly between the rational and the emotional. Because when physicians call and say, I need help with a problem, they are clearly struggling. There's an emotional side and there's the rational side. But inside that struggle, inside that calling, we are constantly looking for where is this hitting me in my sense of calling, in my sense of purpose? How am I rising to that challenge? And when I am through that challenge, what am I doing to take care of myself? It is about relationship-centered communication. We must have the ability to communicate one-on-one -on -one in a compassionate way amongst ourselves, with our patients, patients' families. But we've got to have that relationship-centered ability to communicate in order to be able to be effective in terms of meaning, purpose, calling, actions, consequences. It requires us also to think about inside my struggle right now, what lived experience am I worried about that I am imposing inside this current problem? And is it impacting my ability to plan objectively? Or am I already a little jaded about what might happen next because of a past experience? We need to reflect on those kinds of things and become aware of how those past lived experiences impact the current plan, the future with our relationships, with our patients and our community. And ultimately, through that, we're acting to ensure that medicine preserves its status. And that status is something that the public has given you. You are deemed a professional because the public says we honor and recognize and have given you the means to call yourself a professional. But that caring professional status is in jeopardy right now if we're not able to think about what are my priorities here. And the calling of medicine begins with the top priority being that person who is in need, who's searching out a goal, a good, and you're involved in also finding out that goal, that good, and helping someone. But of all these things in terms of what ethics requires, because we're talking about actions and the consequences of those actions in light of our identity, the ultimate for me is presence, that ability to be there, to silence that pager or that beeper. Now it's not beepers anymore, it's your cell phones. But to silence it and to truly be present with your patient to say nothing else but you are for me right now the most important thing that I ought to be doing. If you haven't already uh, paid any attention or had an opportunity to hear Abraham Vergase ever since he left San Antonio and went out to Stanford, he has an incredible blog right now. And his blog is entitled Being, and it is about being a physician. And when he thinks about engagement and presence, this is one of his, I think, uh, really insightful quotes, which is part of what I see all the time when a physician says, I'm in trouble. Good patient care is found not on a computer screen, but in being truly present with the patient. Presence unifies and strengthens the human dimension in medicine. How present are you now in your busyness of your day? How present can you be, and do you have control over that presence right now? It's an ethical imperative for that moral relationship that you have with a patient to seek out that presence, to protect it, and to be with it, because this is one of the functions of getting back to being a resilient person, is having presence. So the duty to care then, that obligation that I have on myself, not only to care for myself, but to care for this patient, really does contribute to a healing relationship. So you have the healing relationship for yourself, for your family, inside your community, and certainly with your patient. It involves the need for you to have compassion, but to also recognize that inside that need to care for and be concerned for another, you have a responsibility. So there already is the head and the heart. 
You have to be willing to respond and to take care of that need that's coming forth for you. And so that responsibility kicks in the head side, that doing side that you are as a professional. And certainly competence. We expect and need you to be competent at what you do to keep us safe. And we know now that burnout contributes to medical error. So we really have to think about, am I competent when I am struggling because my being and doing are out of connection with my caring and I am really, really in trouble right now? Assurance, responsiveness, that comforting, yes, I am here, we are going to take care of you, I, am, I consider your needs as primary for what I am doing for you. It's not just about you and your patient. This is also now about you and community with your, other, your fellow physicians and how we can help assure and respond and care for each other. Inside huddles now, it's one of those things that we ought to think about doing. In that morning huddle, you check in with each other. How are you today? Anything going on that might impact your ability today that we need to think about so that we can all care for each other. Those days of having to just think about I'm responsible for myself, nobody else, I can't rely on anybody else, those are all gone days. We're supposed to be team players. And this is one way to think about being a team player in terms of thinking through that vulnerability that we have right now. The interactions between the head and the heart are in constant play. But it will require you to have critical reflection and awareness of that tension. Inside ethics, then, we offer a safe place for you to begin to think about the personal side of you that's in tension with this issue that's coming forward. What we're going to do about it, how collectively we might think about it, and how your peers might be able to guide you through, well, yes, this happened to me before, and this is what worked, and this was what didn't work. I know you talk about cases all the time, and you compare notes and stories about things that you have done. This is another element of that in terms of that collective reflection. And then finally, the system. And unfortunately, the system seems to be awfully broken right now. And it goes back to that whole notion of commodity. Healthcare organizations have a meaning and a purpose, but they also have organizational goals and objectives and corporate measurements and all those other things that get us caught in the day thinking about what am I here to do? And if it's a drop-down box on another computer screen, I think I'm just going to throw up because that takes me away from my ability to engage with my patient. My patient remains the stranger because I don't have time to go in and hear the story of what this person is all about, not just the disease. The lack of stories is really impacting our ability to build a good relationship. Evan Pellegrino is one of my mentors from ethics, and God bless his soul, he died last year, but he has written a lot of, about the need for an ethics of or a moral philosophy of medicine. And he puts it inside the notion of the fact that we are helping, but we are also healing, and that we need to think about this. So think about this statement from him. Being sick and being healed mean that in the end we can demand nothing less than competent and compassionate, scientific and learned physicians, intensely aware that their patients and they themselves share the perplexities of the human condition. A major part of that condition is the effort of constant, ongoing reflection on the values that govern healthcare interactions. That's ethical awareness, constant, ongoing reflection of the values that govern your interactions. My fear is that between the commodity, which is health treatment, not care, we are pushing the values to that commodity level and away from the calling, the service, the care level. Oops, let's back that up. Went right through. Okay, so what then does an ethics consultation offer? What am I here to help you think through? Ethics is often thought of as the police. 
This is where you go when you know you messed up. And I'm going to say, oh, yeah, you messed up. And here's what you need to do. That's not ethics at all. Remember, it's about actions in light of your identity. So now let's think about if I call for help with ethics, what are you going to get? This is that thing that becomes a different way to think through the community which involves an ethics consult person or a team to help. So yes, it's a forum. And that forum will help to identify what are all the ethical issues that are at stake. Maybe the biggest issue is the integrity of the physician feeling assaulted by being asked to do something that that physician says, I cannot. That is harmful. It will not help the good which I'm trying to achieve. And I don't feel like I have the permission to say no anymore. I'm just expected to do what a patient wants me to do. So we have to start thinking about what are all the ethical issues at stake. From there, to think about how does ethics then honor all the participants, because it's not just about the physicians, it's certainly about the patient and the patient's family. And we all have authority inside this concern, but we have to respect that there are lived experiences that are going to persuade how we're going to approach this problem and how we're going to walk through it. And those lived experiences contribute to our values, our preferences, and our sense of identity. It gives us then together, collectively, that idea that we can now explore moral regrets and moral distress. A moral regret is, I really, I had to do this and it didn't feel right, but I know it was the right thing to do, but it just, it doesn't feel right. That's moral regret. We have lots and lots of more regrets when we put our heads in the pillow tonight. There are going to be regrets that we're going to think about. But what is distress? Moral distress is that notion that I do not have the authority to make a change that's necessary to do the right thing. And I'm trapped. And I don't have a way out. And I feel a lot of physicians think that right now with the organizational culture that we're in right now, that you're feeling trapped. And it is increasing your sense of burnout and your lack of resilience because you're powerless inside a bigger organization. But I feel as a profession and in a society and as the dominant society of caring in the United States, you have a moral obligation to challenge organizations to move away from commodity back to care. So we have to be able to acknowledge when a consult is going on, there are everyday ethics in play. And there are ethically important moments in a story that tend us to help think through the significance of this clinical care scene and what we ought to do. And ultimately, it promotes a mindfulness of a different kind. This is not the science in play. This is that head-heart struggle again helping me to think through that I've been sensitized. I don't really care anymore. I'm just going through the motions of doing what I need to do for my patients. So are my emotions just blunted? Because this is my everyday now way to protect myself. Has something in my past persuaded me that this is the only way I'm ever going to do this again because this is, I don't want to ever experience that again. And the fear of being vulnerable drives you towards a decision that at the end will be moral regret, not necessarily distress. Willingness to see the situation from another perspective, not just your patient's perspective, but perhaps other peers' perspectives, and how willing you are to open up and think through that. And then finally, going back full circle, to consider your identity again, and whether or not inside that identity you're willing to take the risk to connect, to be engaged, to be in that relationship rather than to stay detached because this isn't a whole lot safer to be detached and to not risk vulnerability and hurt again. So when we do ethics consultation, these are elements that we're putting in. We're not just doing medical history and thinking through options, consequences, benefits, burdens. We're also thinking about you, the person who is struggling with this inside your identity and your purpose, your meaning and your calling, and the consequences of the decisions that are being made. So my offer for you this morning as you begin to think through tools 
ways to think through burnout and resilience. The next time you're challenged with a what ought I to do question, to begin to think through in this process, have I tapped into my everyday story of my emotions and how they impact my ability to practice? Whether or not I'm feeling that I am becoming more of a commodity than a professional who's in an action of a relationship with my patient? And how can ethics help you sort through all of these things in order to arrive at the place which is, this is morally justifiable. This I can do and I ought to do. And it is a search and a meaning and it is the ultimate good, not only for my patient, but for me too in my integrity and in my meaning as a professional. So I want to conclude with one more thought from Dr. Pellegrino. Ethics really is more than just the application of ethical principles. Probably every one of you here in this room think about autonomy, justice, non-beneficence, beneficence, all of those things that you'd learned as principles of ethics. But it's not just applying a principle to a specific case. It is also an invitation to a way of life to the complete formation of you as a human person when you begin to think about calling, caring, doing, being in light of your identity. In medicine, ethics has the positive function of so ordering the process of healing and decision-making as to enhance the humanity of the sick person and of the physician as well. Things for you to think about today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think Belinda and Leanne have set up uh, snacks out in the foyer. So we'll reconvene here at 11 to have the last three talks. Thank you.